Today's guest is an executive and career coach. She's the CEO of her own coaching company and is the host of the Marketing Mambo podcast. She helps high-achieving professionals remove obstacles that keep them stuck so that they can enjoy more success and satisfaction in their lives and careers. She's the author of Winning the Game of Work, Career Happiness and Success on Your Own Terms. Welcome to the show, Terry. How are you doing? Toby, thanks for having me. I am doing great. Thank you so, so much for joining me today on this episode of Mirror Talk. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm grateful that you made the time, you know, to, to teach me today about, you know, everything marketing, everything career, and I'm looking forward to, you know, learning from you in this episode. Um, so, but, but before we jump into, you know, marketing and your career and everything, um, you, are, you have been married for 26 years and you're a mom of three kids. And you told me that when you were a kid, your dad had a job where it required your family to, you know, move over 40 times by the time yes. you were 11 years old. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find this very, you know, very fascinating. So I would love you to, um, you know, share this with me. Thank you so much for sharing this with, with um, sharing this information with me, actually. Um, can you tell me more about your, your life journey so far and how did the moving multiple times, you know, to various places affect you and your upbringing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know that um, moving so frequently is definitely something that's unique uh, about me. And it, it really was a factor that came from my dad's job. Mm -hmm. He um, worked for the telephone company and I was born in the 60s. And um, at that time, they were doing a very large, basically construction project all throughout the southeast in the United States where they were burying the long distance cables because they had been strung between telephone poles before that. Mm -hmm. And so they were just burying them. You know, I suppose it makes it safer and, you know, less, uh, less maintenance and that kind of stuff. So he was on these work crews that would, you know, go into a certain area and do the work. And then when that work was done, they would move them on. And so that's how we ended up moving so frequently. And, and until I was in second grade, we lived in a mobile home. So, you know, given what my dad did for a living and how often he had to move, it actually just made a lot of sense to be able to connect your house to the back of your truck and take it to the next town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so um, when I was a kid, uh, you know, most of those moves actually happened before I started school. Um, once once I got into school, my parents really made a concerted effort to keep us in one community for the whole year. Now, sometimes my dad had to travel and he might be working someplace and staying in a hotel for two weeks and coming home every other weekend. Um, that happened a few times that I can remember as a child, but we would just live in one place. And, um, and so I could just stay at the same school and, mm. you know, I have siblings too. And so same for them. Mm. Um, but when I got to be uh, in fifth grade, my parents moved to Delaware and stayed there. I, actually, they ended up getting divorced mm. <laughs> shortly after they moved there. I think all that moving was really hard on my mom. Mm. Um, but uh, I ended up graduating from high school in, in Delaware and then, and then I've moved around a bit on my own, not not 40 times, but I've moved around several times in my adult life. And, you know, one of the things going back to your question about, like, how did that affect me? Mm. You know, when you've had to adapt to new situations constantly, you actually get good at it. And, you know, one of the things that, well, a couple things, like when you're a child, you don't realize that what you're living through is unusual because you don't know any better. You don't know anything different than what your life is. So I never really felt like it was strange. I mean, I did, I was sad and lonely when we had to move and whenever I had to move away from my friends because generally our moves were pretty far. It wasn't like just to the next neighborhood or even the next town. I lived in a lot of different states. Um, but it, you get good when you have when you're challenged to have to you know come into a new school as a young child and even learning the layout of the school but you know also 
learning who the kids are and learning, you know, I was always challenged to have to learn new things. There weren't, there wasn't anything that was routine to me. And so I got good at it. You know, so now whenever I go into new situations, whether I'm coaching a new person or going into a new job, that I probably pick up on a lot more things, a lot more of the dynamics that are going on, because that is just a a skill that I had to fine tune starting in early childhood. Mm. Um, and I think that it also made me understand change better because a lot of people are really afraid of change. Yeah. And once you've had to go through a lot of change, you start to realize that, yeah, there is, there is that uncomfortable feeling in the middle, like that transition, mm -hmm. but there are ways to learn how to change more easily. Right. And, and once you sort of understand what that is, where, whether it's moving to a new town and, you know, how you slowly but surely get to know how to drive around the town. You know, mm -hmm. first it might be like, I'm going to go from my house to the store and then from my house to the school and then from my house to the post office. And then, and then sh pretty soon you learn how to go from my house to the school, to the post office, to the store, and then you find all the back roads and everything. <laughs> um, but, you know, it can be a little nerve wracking and scary in the beginning, but when you realize that you will learn it, it just gives you confidence to embrace change. And then I think for me too, it just, because I had so much change in my early life that I actually kind of seek it out. Mm. You know, I like, I like a lot of variety. I like a lot of stimulation yeah. because I just had that. It was no choice of mine, but I had that and I got used to it. Yes. I, I love that lesson, uh, lesson of change and being able to adapt to changes, you know, as you said it already and it's correct like we are very scared of changes right but changes are like the only constant things that are in this world so <laughs> everything true. changes from so time true. to time and it's still the most challenging thing because we have to we are scared of adapting or we're scared of uncertainty and I, mm -hmm. i'm glad that you you know your upbringing you know taught you to be able to easily adapt to things and changes that's also mm -hmm. that's a yeah. great lesson. yeah yeah um, you know, one, one of the other things around uh, change is that, and I, I kind of realized this at one of my jobs, it was a job that I really liked. I really liked the people that I worked with a lot and I had a lot of opportunity to be creative and so forth. But, um, one of my very close, um, colleagues got married and moved away. And I just had this sense that, you know, if I didn't make intentional decisions for myself that everything around me would change mm. and so even though i was comfortable and i really liked the job and i liked the people that i worked with i just realized that i probably wouldn't be happy if i just stayed in one place and everything changed around me mm. and so actually that was what happened with that situation was that i just i picked up the phone and called the local university and asked them when their uh deadline was for their mba program and mm -hmm. the it, this was like a monday and, and they <laughs> said well the deadline's friday and so i had my boyfriend at the time go by and this was before the internet <laughs> Mm -hmm. or before the internet was that prevalent mm -hmm. and uh, i had my boyfriend go by and pick up an application and i applied and i got in and a th maybe two or three months later i was i quit my job and gone back to school and it was a good it was a good choice but i just remember that feeling of thinking if i don't if i don't make changes things are going to happen around me and i might not like what it looks like so i might as well just make the change that i want to see yeah. you know just start making it happen even though it's scary yes I, I also believe that's that was a good choice that you made because now you are you know an executive and career coach you own your own <laughs> yeah. company yeah you, you are doing a lot for yourself or some job yes. for yourself so but yeah. i really i really want to learn about your, your your career journey like from that moment you know quitting that job going for the mba up to this moment of you know owning your own company and mm -hmm. coaching a lot of people executives mm -hmm. how has that journey been like for you well, I mean, it's been, it's been good. You know, it's had its ups and downs. It's had its, uh, you know, it's had its really exciting times. It's had its sort of depressing times. Mm. Um, my first, uh, when I first got out of college, I just wanted a job. I didn't really, I didn't know that you should think about what you want to do. You know, I just kind of thought, oh, you just go out and just find a job. Mm. But I was lucky at that time that my boyfriend at the time, he's not that 
that guy is not my husband. <laughs> um, his mother gave me a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? And she advised me to read the book and do all the exercises in the book before I started looking for a job. And I took her advice and that book really, it probably is one of the reasons why I'm a coach today because it really shifted my perspective on how you should approach work. And it really starts with looking at yourself and saying, what am I good at and what do I like to do? Yeah. And so it, the book has lots of exercises to like sort of break down, like what are things that you've done and what have you liked to do and what are your special skills and education, et cetera, and start thinking about it that way. And then looking out in the marketplace and saying, where can I do the things that I'm good at and I like to do? Like where are people paying people to do that? And so I actually ended up getting my first job in a publishing company I was an assistant to the sales uh, salesman in the advertising sales department. And so it gave me an inside view of advertising and the company put on conferences. And, you know, so I understood how magazines worked and like how that whole ecosystem of building audiences so that you can sell advertising, you know, that's mm -hmm. all the heart of marketing. Nice. Um, and so it got me on, on that path to um, doing doing marketing. I worked for a couple of other publishing companies and and then um, worked in marketing for an insurance broker for a while. And that was the company that I was talking about that I actually just decided to quit and go back to school. Um, getting an MBA, MBA was something that had been on my mind since I got out of undergraduate. Um, but I was doing fine in my career. Um, you know, I I was making money and I was learning a lot, but I think I just got, sort of got to that crossroads when I looked around and I thought, you know, maybe now's the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I actually quit and just went back to school full time. And, you know, I did real, I didn't really have money saved up or anything. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it, but, <laughs> but I got in and I figured it out. I got, um, you know, I pieced it together. I mean, this is another thing that I've, I've learned uh, in my life and career is that, you know, you have to set set the goal, even if you don't know how you're going to do it. Mm. And, and uh, I think that going back to graduate school and not knowing how it's going to pay for it. Um, sometimes you just have to start walking on the path. And then opportunities present themselves. And, you know, some of the things that happened then were my boss at that company uh, told me that if I bought a Macintosh computer, that he would give me freelance design work. And so I did that. And that paid, you know, much better than minimum wage. So I did did that part time. Um, I applied for a job at the school, and I ended up getting that. And um, with that job came some actually free and discounted credits towards my degree. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was just, and then I got some loans and I was able just to figure out how to make it work. And, yeah. you know, all of that investment, even though it was a little bit scary since I didn't know how it was going to work starting out, um, paid off. I mean, because once I got out of school, it really put me on a, a higher trajectory in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to get um, a marketing manager job getting out of um, getting out of my MBA program. It was with a publishing company and I'd had that publishing background. Um, I did that for about a year and then um, actually I got married like right after graduation from my business school program. And my husband and I like being newlyweds, we really wanted to buy a house and we were living in the Washington DC area and it was kind of expensive there. So we actually were open to moving to someplace else. And a friend of mine that I met in business school got a job with a bank in North Carolina. Mm. And he helped me um, get a job there. He gave my resume to the head of marketing there. And I ended up getting a job in marketing at this bank. And so that started what, what was uh, a 21 year part of my career that I worked for two large national banks yeah. and um, learned a lot about financial services. And the first bank I worked there for about nine and a half years. And then I got recruited to move from North Carolina to Chicago to work for a bank here. And um, I, that job was a really good opportunity for me. I came in to head marketing for one of the businesses and I ended up working at the bank here in Chicago for 12 years 
And during that time, I moved around between a number of positions within the organization. Mm -hmm. But in 2017, I had been put in a job a couple years before that, that I never really felt like it was a good fit. I actually tried to say no to the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sometimes when you work in big companies, they're like, no, no, we really want you to be in this job. Yeah. And it just never was a great fit. And so mm -hmm. it kind of got me thinking about what was next for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had I had actually hired coaches a couple times. And I really believe in coaching and mentoring. It's something that I've, I've benefited quite a lot from some really great mentors I've had in my career. And I've also hired coaches a couple times mm -hmm. that helped me at some key, key times in my career. And so I, I knew about the profession and I just decided when I left my, I actually decided to leave the company without having another job. I was in a position where I could do that and kind of figure out what I wanted to do next. And I decided to get a certification in coaching and that was 2017 and that's yeah. and here i am today <laughs> wow wow that's it like that's a full cv a full <laughs> yes <laughs> wow, yeah. wow. That, that's awesome and that makes you you know super qualified for the book your amazing book titled winning the game of work like you've, you've done the work already <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, you've won the game already i guess and now you are you are you know i'm still playing <laughs> you're still playing it yes but yes. so far so far you've been winning you've been winning and that's a very yeah, awesome title so. uh, yes i would say like you definitely win some and you lose some but i'd say overall i'm i'm I've, i'm on a winning streak <laughs> yeah that's awesome i'm so happy I'm, I'm so happy for you i'm so glad for and happy about all your achievements so far and yeah it's awesome and that's why I, i'm fascinated um, you know about your book. You know in your in your book, which is available on Amazon in paperback form and also in ebook in ebook form, like mm -hmm. on Kindle. That's right. Yes, mm -hmm. you know you, you teach about how we can be you know happier and more successful when we learn to play the game of work. Yes. So and um, now I'm so I'm um, now I'm so curious. I want to know what is the game of work and how can we play the game <laughs> successfully? Like how can we play this game? Well. You know, I think work is something that most people do not approach very strategically. You know, mm -hmm. when we play games, usually we, we're strategic about how are we going to win this game, right? How, who are we going to put in what, what position on the field? Or, you know, how are we, are we going to be aggressive? Are we going to, what kind of plays are we going to run, right? We, we think that way when we're playing games. A lot of times people just go into work very, they don't think about it at all. They just go in, they think if I come in and I work my, you know, eight or nine hours a day that I'm going to, I'm going to move ahead. Like I, if I just show up and I just do what I'm told, I'm going to move ahead, I'll be successful. And I really think that um, our experience in school a, a lot of us, including myself, I think when I went into the workplace, I just kind of thought like, well, I was pretty, I was a pretty good student. And so whatever I did to be successful in school, I should just be able to do the same thing in the workplace and I'll be successful there. Mm -hmm. And it's not really, that's not really how it works. It's a very different dynamic in the workplace. You know, most, most places where we work are for-profit organizations and most people think more in terms of tasks, doing tasks, than how to make an impact. And I always say that there's really only three ways to add value within a business. Mm -hmm. You're either helping them make money, save money, or reduce risk. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to break it down to the lowest common denominator, you're helping them be more profitable. Yes. You know, and... Um, I think a lot of people don't think about that. They think about, well, like I'm, my job is to come in and do this report. My job is to, you know, answer the phone or to sell things or whatever. Um, maybe people who are selling things understand this a little better, right? Because they're directly helping to make money. Mm -hmm. But all of us are direct, or we're directly or indirectly, we should be recognizing how we're contributing towards that goal. And when we sort of like rise above, like just the day to day, like, you know, making the widgets, we can start to think differently about what we do. We can find opportunities to add more value or to streamline a process. Or, you know, if we see, I, I don't know if they um, say this in Germany, but they or in Africa, but here in the U.S., like when you get on um, public transportation or if you're at the airport, 
they'll do these announcements. If you see something, say something, you know, meaning like if there's a bag left behind or something like that, that could be a bomb or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you see something, say something. And I, I really think that in business, all of us should be looking for opportunities to add value. So if you see something, say something, you know, if there's a process that's not working, don't just complain about it. Like think about how it could be better and contribute in that way to the success of the business. And when we start thinking about work that way, that starts getting recognized, that's leadership, mm -hmm. you know, and that gets recognized if you do it consistently. And eventually, um, you know, people are gonna say, hey, that Toby, he's, he's really bright and he understands the game we're playing here, mm -hmm. right? And he's yeah. contributing, so let's give him more responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I've I've compared it a little bit also to um, the movie The Matrix, yes. um, because like sort of on this on the surface things look a certain way, but like if you get behind like what's going on, on the surface, you see that like oh this is all like code or mm -hmm. you know there's something else going on here, and we have to kind of like get below the surface and say like what's really going on here and how can we can contribute. Yeah. So that was a long way to answer your question, but. Well, that was very explanatory. I, I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, but you're welcome. <laughs> I, I did like some, some rules or some strategies, like from your experience so far. Like you, you, you said you, you win some, you lose some. So for winning the game, I did like some rules and strategies that we could implement to win more than lose. Sure. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, um, a lot of times when I'm working with people that maybe have just moved into a managerial position or a lot of times they've been in it for a long time, but they're, um, they're really stressed out. They're just working super hard. And, you know, I had one client who had gotten promoted from leading a team of eight people to, she got promoted to being a director of the whole department. So it was about 50 people. And she was in that job for about six months when we started working together. And one of the first things that she said to me, um, she said, I'm so exhausted. I am working like 70 hours a week and I'm considering asking my boss to demote me. Mm. And because she was exhausted and she just yeah. didn't see how she could have the impact that she needed to have because how hard she was working. Mm. And what I uh, surmised, and this did end up being the situation, was that she had not mentally promoted herself to that leadership position. She was still trying to run the department of 50 the way that she ran her team of eight. And when she ran her team of eight, she was sort of a player coach. So everybody sort of had the same job responsibilities so that if one of her team members you know, wasn't performing or was overwhelmed that she could jump in and just take the work off their plate. Mm -hmm. And so that was her sort of primary way of managing the team of 50. So it was no wonder she was working so many hours mm -hmm. because she was not leveraging the things that she had at her disposal. And so I worked with her to find leverage points and, you know, a, a lever is a, a tool, right? Where mm -hmm. we can use less effort to get more output. And so that was really what we were trying to do in that situation. And there were, um, you know, a few basic things that we worked on to begin with were um, time management, for example, because she she really believed in having an open door policy and being very accessible to her staff. And so therefore, all day long, people were coming into her office and distracting her from getting her own work done. Yeah. So one of the first things that we did was... Um, have her close her door for two hours a day so that she could get her own work done at work. Mm -hmm. She was worried because she thought, oh, people are going to think I'm, you know, inaccessible or they might need help. And I said, you know, let's see how it works. Right. And it actually worked out fine because, you know, she let them know that she was going to be doing this, but she, um, she found that people actually were finding other ways to get their questions answered, but besides coming to her, they would just ask another colleague, right? Yes, and yes. so there was actually less need for her because they were finding other ways to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are other things to do, like, you know, looking at what is on your own plate and saying, what's the highest value work here? You know, of all of the things on my to-do list, what are the things that only I can do, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And 
try to focus on those things first mm -hmm. and then look at the other things that are on your to-do list and think like, who can I delegate these to? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people have um, a little bit of a mental hurdle to get over when it comes to delegating because, you know, maybe they're really good at what that task is and they can do it quickly. They can do it quicker than somebody else can do it. And so a lot of people will say, oh, it's just quicker for me to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's important to see the opportunity cost of that approach to work mm -hmm. because if you're working on a lower level task that could be delegated to someone else, that means you're not working on the things that only you can do. Mm -hmm. And it also robs people you know, in your department or on your team from learning and growing. Yeah. So the first time or the first 10 times that they do that task, yes, it might take them longer than what it's going to take you. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet you that when you first learned that task, that it took you a long time too. you know, mm -hmm. it took you a time, time to master it. So it's important to, um, you know, look for those opportunities to delegate and, as much as possible, you know, break down those tasks in a way that you can teach it to somebody else and then go ahead and delegate, yeah. you know, free, free yourself from some of that work and give other people the opportunity to grow. Yeah. So those are just a few of the, the leverage points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is very relatable, actually, like for myself, I was, when, when you were talking, I was thinking about myself, like, I really have to work on, you know, delegating tasks to people, for example, even at my, you know, at my place of work, apart from podcasting or um, mm -hmm. other things that I do, like, you know, having to share the responsibility or the task into smaller tasks and, you know, taking the ones that only I can do by yeah. myself and giving right. the others out, I'm outsourcing it or how do you say that? I think outsourcing mm -hmm. to other people. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, really, that's really good. And that helps. But I did like some other skills that we, we could develop, like as a player of the game, are there some skills that we need to develop apart from, you know, delegating or dele is, that, is that a skill actually, mm -hmm. the ability to delegate is a skill, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, there's a few things. I think that um, many high achieving people um, tend to be perfectionists mm -hmm. and when we're moving up in organizations, um, we will be presented with things that we need to do that we've never done before. And sometimes people can, you know, get into that head, that mind space of analysis paralysis, where they're like trying to find the perfect way to get something done. And sometimes it can get to the point where they actually are, you know, getting feedback from their boss about, you know, them not making progress, mm -hmm. because they're sort of like stuck thinking like, what's the perfect way to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to understand that, you know, sometimes we're going to make mistakes as we're learning and as we're, you know, maybe we're doing something that's never been done before. Like you've gotten a project that's new yes. and you're going to have to just try to figure out what needs to be done. And you may make some missteps, but you will learn along the way. Mm -hmm. And um, related to that, I would say, you know, learning to speak kindly to ourselves because a lot of times when we do make mistakes, we will, you know, well, I'll speak for myself that this is a habit that I've largely broken. Um, but I used to motivate myself through negative self self talk, you know, that if I made a mistake, I'd say, well, that was really stupid, you know, you should, you know, that people are going to think poorly of you. And, you know, I, I would, I would say all these things that were sort of negative to myself, I, I suppose to try to motivate me to do better. Mm. But now I, what I try to do with myself and what I advise my um, clients to do is to speak to yourself, that inner voice, speak to yourself the way that you would speak to a friend or loved one who was, you know, trying to do something new or difficult. And that is, you know, if like, say, for example, if I go into a presentation and I, you know, messed up or got the slides out of order or something like that, rather than you know, criticizing myself, I would just say, hey, you did the best you could, you made a minor mistake, you know, you, you, you recovered, and you're fine, right? You made it through it, and you know better for next time, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the way that we would talk to a friend if they made a mistake, right? Yeah. And that's how we need to talk to ourselves, too, because 
when we're really harsh and critical with ourselves, it actually uh, drains a lot of energy mm -hmm. that we cannot use for productive activities. Yes. You know, it's it's useless. It really is useless. So yeah. being kind to ourselves is um, is a good habit. <laughs> yes, yes. So, it's, it's something yeah. everyone has to cultivate, actually. Talk to yourself like you talk to your best friend or to a loved yeah. one. Yes. yes, yes, because we deserve it. We deserve to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, another another um, skill that I, it's critical um, is learning how to influence, especially influence without authority. Um, and it's something that a lot of people have trouble with. Um, sometimes we might call it office politics. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that so many of my clients you know, they might come in and say, oh, you know, the office politics, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I say, I, I understand. I understand why you would not want to have anything to do with office politics, because it can be confusing. And, you know, there are some people that are really good at it. And sometimes that's all they're good at is, yeah. you know, sort of manipulating the situation to get their way. But what I tell people is that if you can learn to learn the game of the office politics, which I call actually influence within the organization. If you can embrace learning to have influence within the organization and work hard, it is an unbeatable combination. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's important when you're trying to influence people is to really look at them and say, what is it that they care about? You know, what, because if we can come up with solutions or even if we can get curious about like, what is it, that would motivate them to take action. Yes. We might be able to incorporate that into our proposal or into the project plan or whatever to get them on board with us. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I think what happens a lot of times is that people will approach others making an assumption, whether it's conscious or not, they make an assumption that whatever, you know, I care about is the same thing that that person should care about, yes. right? And so when they don't, when they don't um, respond in the way that we would respond, we get frustrated and we start blaming them. Mm -hmm. But the thing that they're doing makes sense from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is just sort of like try to position ourselves so we can see their perspective. And then that's how we start to learn how to influence because then we know what they care about. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I believe that's the, that's where we also, you know, get recognition for our hard work or that's how, that's how we get recognition for our values on the job, I guess, I assume. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah. Because well, sometimes, you know, one, one, one people complain and say, oh, I'm working so hard on this job. I'm doing all I could do. I'm giving in all the hours, all the time. But um, yeah, my boss does not see what I'm doing or it does not appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've answered well, that already. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that, yeah, sometimes, you know, bosses, you know, a lot of times they've got many people reporting to them mm -hmm. and they would exhaust themselves if they became too empathetic with everything that the people have to do, yeah. you know. Um, but if we want to get recognition from the bosses, we also have to think about what does my boss care about, mm -hmm. right? Because you're, the boss might care about something different than the actual work, like the work has to be done, but maybe the boss cares about, you know, having something positive that he can take to his boss, mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe there's a particular client that's like his favorite client. And if, if something happens with that client, that's the thing that you go in and tell the boss, but yeah. you, you know, going back to the whole idea of treating work like a game, you have to just like, you know, if you're playing football or you know, soccer, you have to understand the players that you're playing with, understand, like, who can I pass the ball to that has the ability to score, you know, on the other team, who's somebody that is, you know, good at tackling that maybe I should try to avoid, right? Mm -hmm. You have to understand how people play the game, right? Mm -hmm. Observe them. Don't just look at it from your perspective and think like, oh, well, they should do things the way I do them. That's probably what they're thinking about you too. Yes. But you guys both look at it in a different way. And that's why there's conflict. Uh, you, you've just changed the way I, I look at my job already. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'm going into the job, I'm going to see it as a game. I'm going to look at what I'm, I'm supposed to pass the ball to yeah. so score a, a, a goal or something like that. And yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. It actually gets to be kind of fun. I will say, you know, I um, at the last company that I worked for, being the head of marketing, I mean, it's it's exciting when you get to that level, right? But you also are responsible. So even if somebody on my team, you know, didn't do something the way somebody within the business expected them to do, they come and complain to me. And, um, you know, sometimes there would be people that would be that would complain a lot. And I think sometimes our first instinct can be to avoid people that are complaining. But one of the things that I learned to do was actually to sit down with people that are complaining and really hear them out and mm -hmm. really, really try to understand where it was coming from, mm -hmm. you know, to understand, like, am I making assumptions about why I think they're complaining? Or is there something more here that I actually can learn from? Mm -hmm. And one of the lessons that I learned from actually, it's not always comfortable, you know, because sometimes people are blaming you and maybe even saying you're not that smart. This is so obvious. Why are you not doing it this way? Yeah. But I would just say to myself, like, I believe I know what I'm doing, but mm -hmm. I also am open to maybe not knowing everything. And so what can I learn from this person? And a lot of times what would happen is that if I really tried to understand what this person's issue was, and I really earnestly tried to come up with a solution for it, mm -hmm. that it ultimately made me look really smart. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there were probably other people in the organization that were experiencing similar pain points, but they weren't complaining. Mm -hmm. And so once I discovered the issue and I fixed it, and then I could go to other people and say, hey, are you having this problem? Because I have a solution for it. Mm -hmm. And and then people would be like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much for solving this problem. And then I just looked like I was super smart. But it wasn't really me. It was just that I was able to sit down with somebody who saw the problem and thought that I could help solve it. Uh -huh. And I was willing to sit, you know, sit through their complaints and their negativity. But, you know, it wasn't. I think that if we can look at the pro, you know, look at issues, well, I, I say this a lot, like if you have conflict with somebody in the organization, yes. sit down with them and, you know, put the problem on the table. Mm -hmm. Don't look across the table and think like, oh, that person's the problem. That person's not the problem. There is a problem mm -hmm. that they're feeling pain from. And maybe they're looking to you and maybe even trying to blame you for it. But if you can engage with them and put the problem on the table and both look at that and say, what can we together do to solve this problem? You know, people trust you more. You do come up with solutions. And then, like I said, sometimes you can look really smart, even though, you know, all you did was just listen to somebody that was complaining. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I was, I was about to ask you this question, also, like, um, you know, no, everything does not go rosy and smooth in the organization or at the place of work. And I wanted to ask, like, you know, how do we deal with unfavorable conditions as, with colleagues, with our bosses, you know, at work without mm -hmm. burning out or without getting fired? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That, I, now you've looked at my book. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I had a really... Um, I had a really bad boss at one point who was very much a micromanager who... You know, she insisted on looking at everything that I did, but yet I would give it to her to review and she would never get back to me, which caused the projects to be late. And um, at first I tried to avoid her. Like I would just try, and I even got to a point where I would not let her look at the thing. She was my boss, but you know, I was learning that if I gave her a project to look at, I would never get it back. Mm -hmm. I'd always, I, or if I finally would go and say, well, where is this? And this was before, you know, a lot of email attachments. I was actually giving her paper and I'd go in her office and she'd have, she'd dig through piles and she'd finally find it and she never would have looked at it. And it just was, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't that good. She wasn't that competent. But what I learned, um, I, I tried to avoid, avoid dealing with her, but she actually sat me down one day and basically told me that if I kept avoiding and basically disrespecting her authority because mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't respecting her authority. That was her job, even though she wasn't great at it, mm -hmm. um, that I was going to be put on um, notice, like basically that I could, it was like the first step to being fired. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess what I've been doing isn't working. <laughs> so I, what I decided to do, and this 
really hurt me at first. <laughs> I decided to come into the office every morning and go to her office and peek my head in and put a big smile on my face and say, good morning. How are you? I had to grit my teeth, you know, the first week that I was doing that. <laughs> yeah. But what happened really surprisingly was that she had actually been really hard on me. And all of a sudden, after I did that for a week or two, she started dropping by my office and sitting down and wanting to get my opinion. Unfortunately, she kind of started bullying other people in the department, mm -hmm. but it made it easier for me because I engaged her, you know, and I, when I think about it now, I think that she had moved to um, the city in North Carolina where the bank was from Chicago, ironically, since that's where I am now. But, um, you know, she moved there as a single woman. She probably didn't know very many people. She knew that there was a lot of pressure for her to perform. Mm -hmm. And it probably felt bad for her to have somebody like me, like ignoring her and avoiding her. And so she got, you know, really defensive and she used her power against me. But whenever I began engaging with her, she calmed down and she started trusting me. She looked at me as an ally. And I mean, so really what we're talking about here is playing the game, you know, playing work like a game, you know, it's like, had I, I, I had to get beat up a little bit finally to realize like, oh, I can't keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It ended up that she got fired after 10 months. Um, and I actually had spent a lot of time like complaining about her and even going home at night and drinking a lot of wine <laughs> to <laughs> get rid of my stress. Yeah. But the day that I found out that she left mm. or, you know, that she got fired, um, I, I sat there and I thought, I have all this weight on my shoulders that I put on my own shoulders. Mm. You know, it was my choice to be negative. It was my choice to avoid her. It was my choice to complain about her. Mm. And I started to realize like my own power, right, to, to say like, it probably still wouldn't have been fun to have her as a boss, but had I played it differently, it would have been a lot less painful for me. And so that, that's probably one of the um, experiences that I had that gave me the, you know, the courage and the um, insight to start to engage people who were complaining. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not fun, but mm. the alternative is worse. Yes. Well, and you yeah. have less control as well. Mm. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, yeah, I can really imagine that. But yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, you took that, that part of greeting, uh, you know, popping into the office and, you know, even though it was difficult at the beginning, but it gave you a wonderful result yeah. at the end. Yes. yes. That, that was, that was I it. felt better too. I mean, I actually started feeling more, um, you know, positive towards her. And, and it's funny because I, I had um, a few years later, I had another boss and I had a conflict with, with somebody that was, in the larger marketing department that I had to work with, she she was very slow to respond and she wasn't doing some of the things that she needed to do. I think she was just very busy, but I was getting a lot of pressure from some of our internal clients because this woman wasn't doing her job. It wasn't my job, but it was related to what I was doing. And I was complaining a, a lot about her to my boss and my boss said, take her to lunch. And I said, what? <laughs> I don't want to take her to lunch. I don't like her. Yeah. And he said, take her to lunch. Hmm. And so I asked her to lunch. And, you know, it's funny because it's very, it's really pretty much impossible to demonize somebody when you're sitting across the table sharing lunch with them, hmm. you know. And so I started to see her as a human being. She shared with me some of the things that were going on with her at work. And, you know, I had more empathy for her. And I also realized that we were both in the marketing department and the people that were complaining to me, I really needed to side with the people in the marketing department, like her, yes. instead of feeling like, um, you know, I had to apologize to the people in the field mm. for what they weren't getting. I mean, these were just the way that marketing was resourced was a decision that very senior leadership made, right? And we all had to live with it. I mean, this is one of the things I say to people all the time is that, um, you know, when you're in a company, you all work for the same company, right? So if the company makes rules or they make decisions or policies or whatever, sometimes 
sometimes like maybe you're in a department where you have to tell somebody, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And then they blame you for it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels really bad. But I always say, like, take it up a level and say, I have to enforce this rule, but this is a rule of the company, yes. right? And mm -hmm. so I, I just, it, it made me be able to reframe things so I didn't feel so responsible mm -hmm. that I would just say, listen, we all work for the same company. This is, a, this is a policy they put in place and I'm sorry that you would like it to be differently. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe you can talk to your boss or you can talk to somebody else, but I can't give you what you want because it's against the company, company policy policy or you know, in this case, like the people in the field wanted me to step in and do her job. Mm -hmm. yes. And that wasn't the way we were structured. That was not, I was able to do the things, but that was not part of my job. Yeah, I understand. And so, you know, I felt the pressure of like pleasing the people in the field. And after I had lunch with her, I just realized I just need to tell them that's her job. She'll get to it when she gets to it. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry if you don't like it. <laughs> you of, know? of course, yeah. It's not, there's not a lot that I can do about it because this is how it's structured. That's true. Yes, that's very true. So, you know, going back to, to this game again, like now we've removed the unfavorable conditions. You know, we've gone to lunch with that lady. We've you know, greeted our <laughs> yeah, boss. Yeah. I, and now I want to score a goal of getting the promotion that I deserve. I want to score that goal. Uh -huh. How can I yeah, do yeah, it? Yeah. How, can I, how can I get the promotion I deserve? Yeah. Well, I mean, it starts with getting clarity on expectations. So mm -hmm. if you want to be promoted, have a, you know, open conversation with your boss to, to let them know, to say, I want to be promoted. What do I need to do to make it to the next level? And, you know, hopefully they'll tell you, well, if you do, you know, if you do these projects or if you sell this much or you do, do this or that, um, make note of that. And then go out and do it and then come back and say, you know, you gave me these goals. I fulfilled these goals. I'd like to be promoted and see what happens. You know, it, it, a lot of times they're going to notice and they're going to say, that's great. It, you know, we've noticed that, you know, you're exhibiting these leadership qualities and you've fulfilled the expectations and we're going to reward you with that, um, with that promotion. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes um, maybe their hands are tied or maybe they've been disingenuous in terms of wanting to motivate you, but not really being able to promote you. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you just have to decide whether you want to, you know, hold out and maybe hopefully get promoted on the next round of promotions, whether you want to look around the company and see if there are other opportunities there to maybe move into a different department yes. um, or, uh, look out into the marketplace to see if the the skills and the experience that you have might be valued more outside of your company. Mm -hmm. And um, I've actually done all of those things, you know, in my in my career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I asked, was told what I needed to do, and I did it and got promoted. I um, I've done things and not been promoted. You know, done exactly what, the, you know, got, maybe been given false promises, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also um, not been promoted at a company and left and got paid a lot more money. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, especially if you're at an organization for a long time, sometimes the pay raises don't keep pace with the marketplace, what the marketplace pays. Mm -hmm. and um, And also sometimes you can be more valued by another company. Yeah. Like they can say, you know, if we hire this person from a competitor, they can come in and we can learn what our competitor is doing, yeah. you know, or, they, or if they admire, like, I know the company that I got um, recruited uh, to here in Chicago, I think that they had a lot of admiration for the previous company that I worked for. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of things from a values uh, standpoint that were really similar. And so when I, I, I think they told the recruiter to go find somebody from the company that I worked for. And so I, I got hired at this new company here in Chicago. And I was able to bring a lot of best practices in, you know, the, the previous company that I had worked for was a bit more advanced on a number of things. And so I had done that at the old company. And when I came into the new company, 
you know, I was just able to bring in, bring in those best practices and really help them get up to speed in a lot of areas with the marketing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So clarity, like I make it, you know, make it so obvious to your boss. I want to get promoted. This is, mm -hmm. um, tell me what I need to do to get this promotion. And if, the, yeah. if you don't get the promotion, yeah, look for something else to do. <laughs> look for someone yes. else to work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I want to share something that, that happened um, at my last company. I, I had somebody on my team who's extremely bright. She came to work at our company um, shortly after she graduated from college. And she was in a um, junior level marketing role for a couple of years. And she wanted to be promoted. We had a much higher level role um, and she she did apply for it, but she didn't get it. She just was too early in her career to really make that big of a leap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she came to me and, you know, she was disappointed and um, and she was asking, like, what can I do to be promoted? And I just told her the reality, which was that we didn't have a lot of room for advancement within our department. Like there, it just wasn't a huge department. There were only, there weren't a lot of like sort of mid-level roles that she could go from like a junior level role to a mid-level role. And I said to her, you know, I'll try to give you opportunities to grow, but if you want to make a bigger leap, you might have to leave the company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's told, it's funny because she actually is in Europe now. She's uh, in London. Um, she's done fantastic. She was in New York when I was first working with her. And um, she's told me that, that she really appreciated that advice. It wasn't what she wanted to hear at the time, yeah. but you know, she went on to work for another company. When she, was, she went in at a higher level, um, she got an opportunity to go to London and fill in um, for a colleague's maternity leave. And while she was there, actually, she has a, 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 her grandmother was born in Ireland, so she was able to get EU citizenship and, um, you know, and then once she was, she was in the UK, she just, she's been there for years now. Mm. Um, but you never know, you never know yes. where it's going to lead. You know, it's, yeah. it can be a little bit scary to, you know, leave the thing that, you know, but, you know, very exciting things can happen. Mm. Um, if you just, you know, just see what's out there. Yes. And that, 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 you know, goes back to what you said earlier, like about changes, like don't, don't be too scared to make changes. Like mm -hmm. if, some, if something's not working for you, change it and adapt to the changes. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, exactly. There, so, so often we just like tolerate things, you know, we just say, oh, well, I guess this is as good as it can get. And there, there's a saying that I think about a lot, which is good as the enemy of the great, mm. right? Sometimes things are good enough and we're like, oh, well, I'll just accept this. It's good enough. It's not, it's no better anywhere else. Yeah. And if we believe that, and then that becomes true for us. True. But if we believe that we are capable and we want more, and then I think we owe it to ourselves to go out and try to find it. Mm. Um, you know, even if it's it's going to little be a little scary and a little uncertain. Mm. You know, it, it feels fantastic when you you set a goal for yourself and you and you reach it or you yes. exceed it. It yes. feels great. It feels very alive. That's true. Now, now, I really want to learn more about your coaching program. Now, since you helped that lady, you know, to move from New York mm -hmm. to London and she's successful now, I want to know about your coaching program and how you help, you know, high achieving professionals to make it to the next level with, you know, energy and joy. Yeah, yeah. The, the framework that I use in my coaching is, it's a lot of like what I was just talking about, mm -hmm. that we, when I'm working with somebody, we start off with getting really clear on their goals, mm -hmm. right? Like what, what do you want to achieve here? Why did you decide to, you know, get coaching? And then um, once that's clear, we take a look at where they are and where they want to go and we start building that roadmap. Okay, mm -hmm. what are the action steps that you need to take to get from point A to point B where your goal is? Now, we don't always know what all of the steps are, but we can uh, make like smaller goals in between, right? Sometimes we might need to learn things along the way. So that might be a smaller sub goal of that bigger goal. Um, a lot of times when we're putting the roadmap together, we also will identify skill gaps um, that might stand in the way of reaching that goal. And so that these were will be other things that we need to address. So it might be 
you know, sometimes I've worked with people in job search and maybe they worked in marketing for a long time and they need to brush up on their digital marketing skills. And so maybe part of that might be to go out and get a online certificate in digital marketing, mm-hmm. right? So that they can put that on their resume and, you know, let people know that they do have up to date marketing skills. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, if, if um, they're, having trouble delegating right Mm -hmm. (laughs) if they want to get promoted and and um they're they're working too hard right that okay we're going to work on your delegation skills um and then really um the the last thing that we really focus on is shifting that mindset to believe that the goal is possible Mm -hmm. that is critical it's really critical um and so basically what we have is a three-legged stool Figuring out the goal, getting clarity on the goal, figuring out um, or actually shifting that mindset to to believe that the goal is possible and then taking action in that direction. Mm. If we can do those three things, that's how that's how you uh, that's how you win at the game of work. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> wow. And now I want to ask about your, your podcast, Marketing Mambo. If I'm right mm-hmm. here. And you, now, yeah. I think it comes from your inspiration from, you know, working in the marketing world in, in or work marketing department. And in this, in your podcast, you, you have conversations with marketers from all around the globe. So can you mm-hmm. tell me, can you tell me more about this podcast and what are some lessons that we could learn from the various fascinating conversations that you have on the podcast? Yeah, well, um, I started the podcast in January and it really came out of a conversation that I was having with one of my uh, clients who mm. is a marketing consultant. I actually, because of my background, I actually work with a lot of people in marketing and advertising and communications. You know, I think that they like working with me because I understand the you know day-to-day realities of working in those fields. Mm. Um, so she and I were having a conversation and she just made a comment like, wow, this is such a great conversation. It would make a great podcast episode. (laughs) And I just thought, Oh, well, you know what? I'm enjoying this conversation and I love marketers and I love talking about marketing. So I started the, I started the podcast in January and the lessons, you know, I taught, I really talked to people that I feel like I could learn something from. Mm -hmm. And I have talked to, change management consultants. I've talked to design thinking consultants. I've talked to people who have started advertising agencies. Um, I, I actually was just editing uh, a podcast of somebody who's in Germany, actually, um, who had his own agency and really was completely burning out because mm-hmm there was so much work to be done. He was just working 24 seven and he came up with this whole um, process about how to uh, organize work, how to um, hire freelancers all over the world Mm. to, um, to reach goals without that much management. Mm. Right. And so it's everything about like the way that he trains. Um, He uses like videos to train people. He's got a very consistent process. He develops KPIs that, um, you know, are tracked consistently with each one of the um, of the freelancers. Mm. Um, So there's not that necessity to be on like Zoom calls, you know, from. 18 hours a day, which, you know, I know, I know a lot of people in this age, especially in global companies that, you know, okay, they're, if they're in North America, they're, um, they're up very early to talk to the people in Europe and they're up very late to talk to people in Asia. Right. And then they're working all, all day long and to think about like, oh, okay, if we could just figure out what the KPIs are and put all that information into you know, some kind of tool that everybody has access to. And then we would just know that things are moving along towards the goal. So anyway, I mean, I just love talking to people about different ways of, of thinking mm-hmm. um, in terms. And it, you know, my, my podcast is not really a how to, mm-hmm. it's really about getting perspectives from people who, um, you know, them telling their stories and, just getting perspectives and learning to think differently about or learning period about different um, 
different types of marketing or areas or, or even things that touch marketing, mm. you know, like the change management. I wanted to talk to the change management consultant because a lot of times in marketing, we are, um, we are engaged, engaged in change. And so yes. understanding how somebody who does it professionally um, does it, I just thought would be really insightful for my listeners. Yes, I find it very insightful also. So I'm going to place the, the link to your podcast and your website and also to the book on Amazon in the show notes of this episode. So I encourage everyone who is listening to buy the book, to listen to the podcast and also visit your website to, you know, get your coaching programs and everything that you do. But for people out there, what, what's the best way to connect and work with you? Well, the the best way to connect with me is to go to my website, which is terrybmcdougall.com. And you can set up a, well, I mean, you can check me out. And there's a couple uh, free chapters of my book out there that people can read if they want to learn more about that. Um, there's also a blog. But uh, if you are interested in talking to me, you can set up time there. There's a link to my calendar on the website. I would also be happy to connect with any of your listeners on LinkedIn. My mm -hmm. handle on LinkedIn is Terry B. McDougall, and I'm pretty active out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, my podcast is Marketing Mambo. People can listen to that on all of the platforms you know it's on pretty much it's on like 20 platforms um, but you can also go to the website which is marketingmambo.net yes. and it actually also has its own page on linkedin which is marketing mambo wow that's awesome i'm going to place all of this and then yeah yes. the book the book's on amazon worldwide uh, yeah. winning the game of work yes yes I'm, I'm going to place the link in the show notes of this episode and as in, I don't want to stop speaking with you, but I have to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tobio, it was great talking to you. I hope you have a good weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. I wish you the same thing also. And thank you so much for everything you've taught me today, like sharing your story with me, reminding me of the importance of changes and being able to adapt to changes. And everything I've been able to learn from you in this episode has been so wonderful. Thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate it. Thanks, Toby.